Sunday.
so excited that you guys chose this Sunday today to worship together. Uh, I, I, I am just expecting great things. Someone say great things. I am expecting great things when it comes to our following our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But today, at this moment, this is our moment to set them free. Give them free. Our kids are now released to our youth. Amen. They can go to the competent care of our volunteers. No, I mean, why are we going to call them volunteers? They're our servants. Amen. Serving God first. So they are welcome to go into the back and to enjoy their time running around the gym. Please, oh please, do not allow my daughter to fall this session. We give it to the Lord. I think, Cliff, we have our new choir member. Amen. As soon as he can walk, he'll be on the choir because he wants to sing unto the Lord. Amen. Well, once again, we just thank you. This is your first time here. We pray that you will fill out a connection card. That's the way that we stay connected. That's the way that we know what's going on so we can celebrate certain things in your life. And if you take that connection card to our welcome desk out front, they have a special gift just for you with your name on it. <laughs> Amen. But if you're here, you've been here for a while and something's changed. Uh, 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 you've been married. You, you, you have more children. You've moved. We ask you to fill that connection card also so that we can stay updated with any change in your life. Who's excited? I mean, who's really excited about together, being together? Amen. I am excited. I, 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 it brings a smile to my face for us to come together. So I pray. I hope that you are praying for us as we pray for you. But let us continue to worship our God in spirit and in truth.
today, touch somebody's heart and reach somebody. We know that there's somebody out there that needs this message. We just pray that they hear this message and they know that you give us eternal hope much better than anything this world could ever give us. We praise you and we ask you to bless us in this name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing this day? Amen. This is the day that the Lord hath made. We shall be grumpy and complain about it, right? That's, that's the word, right? This is the day the Lord has made. We shall root for the eagles and be glad that they got Devante. No, that's not it either. This is the day the Lord has made. We shall rejoice. Let's rejoice in the Lord this morning. It says, and be glad in it. Everyone say it. Look at the person beside you and say, what's your it? Because he says, rejoice in it, no matter what that it may be. Rejoice in it. I'm hoping that you are rejoicing no matter what that it is. Well, I'm excited about this day. Um, there's a lot of reasons why I'm excited. I have friends in the crowd. I'm not going to say who they are, but I have friends in the crowd. A great event has just happened in the Redmond household. Uh, I am now Dr. Redmond. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Pastor Larry, you weren't in school. I thought your wife was in school. Yes, but the two shall become 
Amen, amen. My wife has completed her doctorate in family and marriage therapy. So now on my business cards, I will write Dr. Redmond. That gives me an extra $2,500 when I go preach in T.D. Jake's church. Amen. <laughs> Amen. No, but we are so excited. Uh, I want to say just from the stage, babe, I'm so proud of you. I am so proud. She has been through it. She has not stopped going to school since she's left her parents' home. So bachelor's, master's, 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 master's. And then the doctorate, and she walks on the 11th. So keep us in prayer. She graduated from Eastern University, I guess, with a degree in family and marriage therapy. So now when I lay on the couch, now she is giving me therapy. Uh, I, was, I was excited about her husband. Like, babe, you want to go to the couch? You know, that meant something different to Vince. Going to the couch now means something totally different. Now I'm just a research project. Um, but that's okay. That is okay. We're going to pray. We're going to jump into God's word. Um, so let's do that now. Lord God, we thank you for this day, God. We thank you for this opportunity, God, just to sing your praises, God, and to learn more about you. God, we pray that today would be a day where we would just grow, that we would lay all those trials and tribulations at your feet, and that we would seek to be more like you. Lord God, well, we know that, um, that you are an awesome God. You're an amazing God. So God, we pray that our lives would just resonate, that our lives would be a shining example of what you've been to us. With that this moment, God, I pray that you would hide me behind your cross, that you allow uh, your son Jesus Christ to be seen and not Pastor Larry. Lord God, allow the bloodshed cross of Jesus Christ to be uplifted today and be glorified because your word says if I be lifted up, that you would draw all men unto yourself. So we give you all of the drawing, God. Lord God, you know that I studied, but I need your strength. I'm prepared, but I need your power. I'm willing and I want to, but only you can make me able. So silently now I wait for thee. Humbly I ask for thy will to see. Open mine eyes and illumine me. Spirit divine, amen. And amen and amen. Well, you guys, this, this is our last Sunday on hope. Oh, hope was good. Was hope good for anybody else? I mean, it just seemed like it just came right at, the, right at that right time. And that's what God's word, like, when we're planning these sermons and we're getting these sermon series together, these are months in, in advance. And it just seems how God is so awesome that he gives to us something that, that we were just planning months ago, but he makes it appropriate for a time such as this. Because that's, a God, that's the kind of God that we serve. He, he's eternal. He knows it all. So he knows, he, he knew, he knew before my wife was even born what she would be going through and the day that she'd be graduating. She knew, he knew before everything else about everything that we were going through right now as a nation and even as a church. And that's the type of God that I love the fact that I serve. I love the fact that I serve a God that cares and he knows. He, he, he's omniscient. He knows it all. He's, op, he's omnipresent. He's everywhere. Someone say airware. He's everywhere, and he's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. I love that. I love that. I love that. You guys, know, you guys know that Pastor Larry wasn't saved his entire life. You guys do know that, right? I did not come out the womb preaching the word of God and disseminating between my daycare sitters about the salvation of Jesus Christ and the blood-stained cross of Jesus. I did not come out that way. I did go through some things. But I thank God that all the things that I've gone through led me up to this point. And I thank God. And I, want, I don't want anyone here to regret anything that you've been through. Because we serve a God that's able to turn it around. Someone say, turn it around. Turn around. What does Joseph say? What you meant for evil, God meant for good. This is not, actually, this is not even on my notes. This is just God right now. Amen. He's able to turn that thing around. So I'm not sure who I'm here talking to right now or online, that God can turn it around because he is eternal. He knows it all. He's the provider of our hope. Remember, remember, we, we, we define hope. We define hope as standing in the present, looking back when, looking to back what God has done, and now projecting that into the future, into the then. That confident expectation that not that it may happen, that, that it might happen, but that it will come to pass. Amen. Amen. So that's what we've been standing on these last four weeks, on this idea of hope. And today I'm really excited. I don't know if you guys... I'm, I'm, usually less, I'm usually less than this, right, Samantha? No, I'm not. No, I'm not. 
But I'm, I'm really excited about today. And I know you guys say, oh, preachers always say that. In every Sunday you're excited about this word. I am. I am because today I believe that this idea of eternity is something that we miss as believers. I believe that we miss it. And, and, and I believe that as we miss it, we miss out on certain things that God has in store for us. Because we're living for the now. We're living for the moment. We're living just enough for the city. You guys, you guys don't know that, huh? That's, that's a Motown. We're living for the right now, and we miss the then because we're so concentrated on the now. Yes, yes, we do have to prepare for retirement. Yes, we do have to, uh, uh, we have to make sure that our bodies are in sync and, and, and checked up. Yes, but our eternal hope, our hope should go way beyond the now. And, and today, I want us to be able to refocus this thing, this idea of eternal hope or our hope for eternity. And to do this, I went to the first book of Peter, the first chapter. Now, I'm going to read the New, new um, American Standard, but I want to reread it in the New Living Translation. I'm just going to read the first, the New American Standard, just to give us a little idea about where we're going. And, and if you guys do not know, I, 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 I love the Bible. I love all Scripture. You know, I love, you know, there's some people in the Old Testament that I can definitely identify with. But I'll tell you one thing. Peter is my boy. I'm telling you, Peter is my man. Listen, listen, listen. <laughs> Peter will cut your ear off and then pray for you afterwards. Peter will deny you to your face and say, it wasn't me. It wasn't me, Shaggy. I love Peter because why? Peter got it wrong, but God. Peter did not always understand it, but God. Peter walked on water, sank, but Jesus was still there to give him a hand and pull him up. But God, I love Peter. So if you have not spent time in, in 1 and 2 Peter, I would advise you to do so. We're in, 2, we're in 1 Peter, the first chapter, verses 3 through 9. This is what the Lord declares. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy, someone say great mercy. According to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Doc, I mean, pa Pastor Gary talked to us a little bit about this living hope. We're going to get to it later, but... Born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, and will not fade away, reserved in heaven just for you who are protected. You are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time, God is going to pull back the curtain in the last time. In this, you greatly rejoice, even though for a little while, someone say a little while, just a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed. Who's been distressed? By various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which perishes through tested, though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise. Our, 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 our trials should be resulting in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy, unexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your soul. Your faith ends with the salvation of your soul. Now, in the new living, this is how it reads. It says, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that you have been born again. Because Jesus, because God raised Jesus from the dead. Now we live with great expectations. Someone say hope. We live with great expectation. Remember, hope is, is, is confident expectation of what's to come. We live with great expectation. And we have a priceless inheritance. It's priceless. It is an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach 
of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. Everyone will see. Remember, it says, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. So to be truly glad, there is a wonderful joy ahead. Someone say eternity. There is a wonderful joy ahead, even though you must. And I hate that word, but it's in God's scripture, it's in God's word. So it tells us that you must endure many trials for a little while. Don't let anyone tell you that as a believer that you're, because you're going through, that means that you're not a believer. Because it says right here that we must endure trials for a little while. I like that little while part. But, but there may be some trials that may not tr- for a little while. Remember, remember, Paul had that thorn in the flesh. It never went away. We never really understood really what it was, but it pained him enough that he went before the Lord thrice to say, take it away. Take it away. Take it away. And God responded by saying that my grace is sufficient. I'm not going to take it away because that makes you, it says, in my weakness, what? It's in our weakness. And it says, but these trials are going to come. It says, these trials will show that your faith is genuine, is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through the trials, through the fire, what was that? that? Shaka Khan through the fire, through the limit. It says, through the fire. I lost my spot. Through the many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. You love him, even though you've never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him. That's faith. And you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. It's a lot in that. It's a lot in that, but it's so good. It's so good. So I'm going to give you a little context. You guys know me, and my wife is tired of me saying it, but I'm going to say it until I can't say it no more. A little context, because we know a text without context is nothing but a pretext. You guys are going to get it soon. A text without a context is nothing but a pretext. So, so a little context. This book of Peter, this book written by Peter, was written to a group of believers that were going through hard times. I know that's, that's not us. That we, we don't, we're not going through hard times now. Mm-mm, no, no, I'm telling, you, I'm telling you, I'm sick of these masks. I'm telling you that right now. I'm sick of these masks. And when I'm in a joyful spirit, and, and I got to attest, sometimes I don't do it intentionally, but, but sometimes at night my wife will say, can you stop past Walmart and pick, pick up some things? And I'm like, sure, baby, you know, sure, you know. I'll go get it. It, it, it. it means that I have to have spend some time by myself, Vince, and not around the kids running around the household. I will sacrifice and go to Walmart. And the other day I went to Walmart and I was just happy. I had my earbuds in. I got out of my car and I'm walking in Walmart for at least 30 minutes, smiling and talking and saying, why is everybody looking at me funny, Lynn? I was about to check out, realize I had not put my mask on walking through Walmart. My spirit does not cling with these masks. I'm a smiler. I'm a hugger. I'm a up close in your face. But, but I, I think that we are going through some hard times today. Amen? They were going through some hard times, and they were being scattered. Why? Because they were doing something wrong? No. They were scattered because of their faith. They were doing what they were supposed to do in the eyes of God, but they were being scattered, and they were going through some hard times. So God, through his spirit, inspires Peter to write this book, to give them a little encouragement and to show them that there was purpose behind their sufferings, that there was purpose behind their trials, that for every trouble that came their way, that God had a purpose behind it. And I want you to know that same thing, that that whatever, whatever, I don't care what you're going through, that there is a purpose behind it. I love the fact that Pastor Gary said that when he was in, was, uh, was in jail, 
That, 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 that person ministered to him, because you can get down on yourself when you're in that situation. And he said he ministered to him and said, no, you're not in jail. You just started your, your first year of Bible college. That's, 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 that's hard right there. But there was a purpose for that. And he pulled him closer to God than it had ever done in the past. There is a purpose behind what we do. And, and P- Peter is, is telling these, these people about this wonderful, glorious eternity that's ahead to get their minds off of the now and into the then. I think we could, we could deal with a little bit of that today ourselves. To get our minds off of the now, because the right now, I don't know if we can say this in church, but Pastor Jeff is not here. The now stinks. Can we say stinks in church, Pastor Ron? Yeah, that's, that's a nice way of saying it. It stinks. The now I'm going to stop right there. It's not good. But if we remain focused on our now, we'll take that in, and we will now become affected by the now. But we're not called to be infected. We are called to be influencers. So we can't allow our now to affect what we see ahead. So Peter tells them that, and then, and then in verse 2, of the chapter, Peter introduces them to this idea of this trinity. In verse 2, he tells them about the the, the idea of the fact that they were saved because God foreknew that that you would accept that open invitation from grace. That that goes to everyone. And so, so the fact that God just foreknew that you would accept that invitation, and that once you accepted that invitation, which is that rebirth, that's that being born again, that's that regeneration, that the Spirit of God would now come into you. He talks about the Spirit in verse 2, and how that Spirit now begins to sanctify you. Sanctification is the process that it sets you apart for a purpose. You're not just set apart to sit on the side of the bench and not get any time in. It's for a purpose. Sanctification, the Spirit of God working within you. And not only that, he ends by the fact that, 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 that the final part of that salvation is the blood of Jesus Christ. The, 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 the bloody cross of Calvary. I mean, we look at Christianity today and think it's a nice, you know, a, a fluffy thing. But Christianity is, is, is bloody. It's nasty. And it doesn't feel good at some times. But everything that Jesus went through was for a reason, and he chose, he chose to do it anyway. His flesh wanted something different. That's the humanity of Christ. He says, I, I, if, if, it, if it be, let this, cat, let, let this cup pass me. Basically, he was saying, no, I'm okay. I, I don't know if you've ever been to, um, they have a, a Brazilian uh, steakhouse in Philadelphia. And boy, oh boy, oh boy, if you've never been to a Brazilian steakhouse, you guys need to go. It costs about... $60, but is this, you know, I'm telling you, get your money's worth. And, and you have a card on this table, and it's green and red. And you turn it on green, and they come past, and they just cut meat for you. They cut prime rib. They cut pork chops. They, cut, they just cut meat. They just walk past you and, hop pasada, hop pasada, hey, what's the matter with you? And they're just cutting, and they're just happy about giving you more meat, more meat, and more meat. But there comes a time that you can't have no more meat, Herman. Sometimes, I mean, I mean, to look like you and me, brother, he looks way better than I do. Um, you got to say no. At a point, Jesus says, no, if, if it be mine, let this cup pass me. But he says, not my will, but thine will be done. It's not about the now. It's not about what I feel right now. What my body is telling me is about the then. And, and, and this is what Peter relays to them about this. He, he wants them to understand that, that like Hebrews 13, 14, It says that this world is not your permanent home. We're looking forward to a home yet to come. That's not in the notes. I threw that in this morning. Hebrews 13, 14. This is not our home, but don't we live like it? Don't we live like this this is where, this is our resting place? This is it. We have to reshape that thinking. We we have to move in a different way. I have a little illustration. I'm going to look at it now, and then we're going to look at it again. Um, I, and and I've learned in Bible college, the first time you do something, you, you give the person's name. You say, this is, you know, Francis Chen. I saw this illustration of Francis Chen. The second time you do something, you say, I've heard it. The third time is yours. So, so uh, you guys are going to hear this again. By the time I get to the third time, it's going to be Pastor Larry's. I've come up with this illustration. But, but eternity, eternity for us is kind of like this rope. 
And just imagine that, that as I pull this out the bag, that, that this rope goes on forever and ever and ever. That's eternity. When we get saved, that's what changes. That little part right there is our lives here on earth. This small little black portion, that's our lives. In proportion to eternity, it's nothing. But what do we live on? What do we live for? This small little section of the rope. We have all eternity ahead, forever. And, and, and I, I, I love math. I am a math guy. And there, there's, a, there's a formula, and, and I'm not sure. I, I, I just heard it um, this morning, actually. But it's a formula that says that anything divided by eternity equals zero. Anything divided by eternity equals zero. So I don't care. Listen, my, my, my great-grandmother lived to be 105. That's a long time. I got longevity. I told, told my wife, you are not going to outlive me. I'm going to run to the race. We're going we're gonna to be both in that old folks' home together. No teeth, applesauce, eating, loving each other, being pushed around by our daughters. But even if I live to be 110, that's nothing in retrospect to eternity. We have to stop living for this little small section and start living for eternity. As believers in Jesus Christ, what are you living for? In the comment section, I want you guys to say, I'm living for eternity. That I'm living for eternity. That yes, I have troubles going on, and yes, these things are going on in my life, but I'm living for more than just the now. And Peter explains that. Peter explains that in this text, in verse 3. And he gives us three things that, that as a believer, as we look towards eternity, he gives us three things that we begin to possess as we begin to shift gears and begin to look towards an eternal hope, an eternal confidence of the present looking back when and projecting into the future or into the then. And Peter talks about this in verse 3, and the first thing, the first thing that Peter tells us about, when we have this eternal hope, this hope for eternity, the first thing it gives to us is a living hope. Someone say living hope. Pastor Gary preached about that a few weeks. In verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope. He opens with a state of thanksgiving. He says, praise be to God. He starts up with this exhalation of, of, of praise to God about the salvation of a believer and that this, that, that this particular hope that we have grabbed onto, that is not because of us. It's not because that you deserve it, Craig. It's not because I deserve it. It's not just that, that, that anyone here deserves it. It says, it's according to God's what? Abundant mercy. Which, which is in, in connection to that new birth, that salvation, that, that being born again. The fact that eternity is now connected because God's given us abundant mercy. We know the difference between grace and mercy. Like, once again, like many times, at least when I was growing up, grace and mercy were almost synonymous. You know, there was a song that said, your grace and mercy brought me through. Grace and mercy. We know grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. is things that God given us that we don't deserve. We don't deserve it, but he gives it to us. God's mercy is him withholding that thing that we do deserve. It's saying that you deserve to die and go straight to H-E double hockey sticks because we have kids in the room. You deserve that, but the mercy of God withholds that. Not because of us, but because of his son, Jesus Christ. God has given us a hope for eternity. This new birth, this, this, this living hope was established not because of us, but like I said, because of the death and resurrection of Jesus the Christ. That's the reason that we have this type of hope. But when Jesus walked this earth, and even to this day, many people, we, we, we live not with a living hope, but we have a temporary hope. A lot of us have a temporary hope that's connected by what we see or what we hear. And many, especially believers at that time, when, when Jesus went to the grave, so did their hope. When Jesus 
died on the cross, their hope died there as well. How do I know? Because in Luke chapter 24, uh, this is the story about the road to Emmaus. I mean, Emmaus, excuse me. The road to Emmaus. This is after Jesus' death. And, 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 and they're walking down this road and they're talking. And, and I love the way Jesus just pops up and no, one is exp- no one's surprised. No one's surprised. They're walking down the road and somebody pops up and starts talking to them. Like first, I don't even know. I don't even got to know that you're Jesus or not. But you're just popping up and jumping in my conversation, Cliff? Come on. You got to have a little better than that. But they're walking and talking and, and this, this person just pops up and, and Jesus talks to them and says, what's going on? And they look at him like, you, once again, this is, I'm sorry, this is the NIV, this is the Negro International Version. I'm giving a little sauce to it, a little differently. This is not what you're going to find in Scripture. So he pops up and they, and they say, well, who are you? And he said, well, what, what are you talking about? And they said, well, we, we're talking about this person called Jesus. And it's funny that they're going to tell Jesus about Jesus. And they said, you, you, you must be the only fool that hasn't heard about this. This man, Jesus, he was a great prophet. He, 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 he had taught many different things. They, they, they said that, that he had made many miracles. This is what they saw, the miracles that he did. And they said that he was a great teacher. That he, he taught things that they heard. And they said that these leaders, these priests, had put him to death and condemned him to death. And in verse 21, this is where the fact that I know that their hope had died with Jesus. It says that we had hoped. Not that, that, that we have hope. They lost their hope. It says we had hoped. He was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. When Jesus died, so did their hope. Think about it. Even with Peter. When Jesus died, what did Peter say? He said, did Peter say, I want to, you know, fight on? No. Peter said, I'm... I'm I'm going fishing. I'm I'm going back to what I'm used to. How many here goes back to what they're used to when things get tough? Go back to that thing that you know that you're not supposed to be going back to. That you make that call to that girl that you know ain't good for you. You you, you go and you reach out to that. See, we used to have state stores back in the day. They're not state stores in Delaware, are they? They're just stores because they sell liquor everywhere here. I'm going back to that, that 40 year old. See, we drank 40 to OE back then. I don't even I have no idea what the young guys drink now. That was horrible. I never, I never liked that drinking. But we go back to the thing that we know we're not supposed to do. Peter said, I'm going back to fishing. And be careful because the things that you do not only affect you, they affect others. Because not only did, did, did Jesus, I mean, not only did Peter say, I'm going fishing, but he brought the whole crew with them too. And they all went back. They lost hope. They lost hope. We had hoped. Peter, before the resurrection, he was a coward. He denied Jesus. How? I don't know him. What are you talking about, Jesus? You mean Jesus? No, I don't know him. But after the resurrection, what happened in the book of Acts? Peter's now preaching to thousands, declaring the name of Jesus, saving people everywhere to the fact that he wasn't even worried about his life anymore. He moved from being a coward to being courageous. What did it? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. He lost hope when Jesus went to the grave, but living hope was restored when Jesus rose from the dead. That living hope is built and based on the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. And then Peter gives us these ideas, which is the strength of the hope, which I just said, which is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the fact that Jesus rose from the dead, that we as believers can now proclaim the name Jesus to this day. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 14 and 17, it says, If Christ has not been raised, then all of our preaching is useless. And your faith is useless. Verse 17, and if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. Our living hope is based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the reason that we can have hope for eternity because of the raised Son of God, Jesus Christ. But not only is that the strength of our hope, but he talks about this living hope and that the substance of that hope is that inheritance that we all have. 
verse 4, he talks about this inheritance. That, that, that's a benefit that's been given to you that you didn't work for. You guys know what inheritance is. That inheritance comes from one person dying and then you getting something from them because you're in the family. Someone say in the family. Because you're in the family. Not because you know them. Not because you heard of them. But because you're in the family. You now get this inheritance. That's the source. I mean, that's the substance of our hope. The fact that we are in the family. And he talks about the fact that, 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 that this hope is imperishable. It's undefiled. And that it will not fade away. It's yours forever. Put a stamp on it. Send it away. It is yours. That's the type of living hope that I want us to have about eternity. It is yours. It can't fade away. It can't be defiled. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, he says, I lay not up your, yourself treasures upon earth. That's why our inheritance in eternity is so important. He says, do not lay them up on earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, and whereby thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust do corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where is your treasure? There your heart will also be. Where's your treasure? They used to say, um, show me your checkbook. I don't think everybody has checkbooks any longer. But they said, so, show me your checkbook and I'll show you where your heart is. Where's your treasures? That's the that's the source of our hope, and the security of our hope is that it's laid up in heaven. It's laid up in a place that, that you can't get to until you cross that pearly gate. It's laid up, it's secured, it's reserved for you and for me. It's an inheritance that's being kept by the power, the dunamis, power of God. We learned about that on Wednesday. If you guys were in the, uh, our, our LCC Live, dunamis, actually it means that it's God's power that has the power to, 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 to be destructive but also has the power to be constructive. It can build up, but it also has the power to tear down. That's the dunas power of God. So we have a living hope that's, that's, that's connected with this idea of eternity. But not only do we have this living hope that Peter tells us about, but we have an enduring faith. We have an enduring faith. The faith that Peter tells him that, that the fact that, listen, um, the reality is that you're going to go through some sufferings. The, the, I mean... We say, Benedict, just keep it real. Just, just, just keep it real with me. I, I, I don't, don't, don't play around. Just keep it real. Let, let me know what it is. And Peter lets them know that there is going to be suffering that comes in the life of the believer. But you have to continue to endure. You have to continue to press through. It says, I press towards the mark. It's a pressing to get through. In Psalm verse 34, 19, it says, many, and I hate that word, but many are the afflictions of the righteous, of the saved. But I love that word but, Samantha. This is but. Someone say but. But means there's going to be a 180 degree turn. It was going this way, but now it's going that way. He says, many of the affliction of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Our enduring faith is the fact that I have eternity. I'm going to go through some things, but God. That's secure. It's, it's, it's like growing up when you had a big brother. I was the big brother, so I had to call my big homie. But it was great to be, to be in a fight and know that you had a big brother that everybody in the neighborhood was scared of. Oh, you tough then. I talk all kinds of, well, we get, well, go get him. Go, go get Eric, because you, 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 you know I got my brother behind me. We have an all-powerful God that's right there with us. So what type of boldness can we also have? What type of faith can we also lock into? But Peter says to them that, that, that this, this idea of having these troubles that come our way, that they're manifold. And that there are manifold troubles, many or various troubles that are going to come our way. But we're not going to touch on it. But in chapter 4, verse 10, he also shares the flip side of it. He says, yes, in chapter 1, that there's manifold troubles. But in chapter 4, verse 10, he says, but there are manifold graces of God. That's great. The fact that there are many troubles, many kinds, many sorts, but there's graces of God that are many to supply. That there's a grace of God that can cover every trouble that comes our way. It, 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 it lets us know that we can stand the test of time. That we can endure 
through it all. Isaiah, I love this one, Isaiah 43, 1 through 2. It says, don't be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you go through deep waters, what? I'll be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. That's the fact of our faith that we have a God that's with it through it all. No matter what you're going through, he's right there with you. That's the type of God that's, that we serve. He's not somewhere just up on high looking low, watching you going through and just laughing. I talked about it a few weeks ago. It's, 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 that, it's those footprints in the sand. Yeah. You thought he forgot about you, but when actuality, he was carrying you through it all. Yeah. He's with you through it all. So we not only have a living hope, not only do we have enduring faith when we look towards the future, but we have a captivating love. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Captivating love. Yeah. That, that, that's the kind of love, I, listen, I listen. <sighs> when I saw my wife at the altar, Vince, that was a captivating love. I didn't get to see her. I tried to sneak into the room that she was getting made up in, but they would not let me in that room. But when she walked down that aisle, she began to cry because she thought I was Idris Elvis. <laughs> no, no, no. That was a captivating love. But that was captivating to my level. Now let's take that to a whole another level. That's the captivating love that God has for us. It says, for God so loved the world that he so agape the world in your mess with your dirty feet, with that one corner that you don't want anyone else to see, he loved you. Everybody. Not just the ones that deserved it, but he loved the ones that even going to turn their back. He loved the ones that put the nails in his son's arms and feet. He loves the world. And that's a captivating love. It's a love that kind of makes you want to do right. You know, you, nobody wants to disappoint their prayer parents. That type of love, but it goes beyond that. It's a captivating love for an unseen Savior. He talks about the fact that we love Jesus even though we hadn't seen him. Peter seen God. He saw Jesus, which was God in the flesh, and he spent time with him. So his love to him, he felt Jesus' love. And so it would seem almost right that he would reciprocate that love back to Jesus. He saw Jesus in the flesh. But these believers, and we, we haven't seen him yet, and still we love him. That's a captivating love. That's, that's, that's a, there's, there's a show right now. It's called, um, what's it called, babe? Married, Married Before. Married at First Sight. If you guys have never seen this show, I watch it. Don't you judge me. Don't you judge me out there, Rob. Don't you, don't tell them, don't you judge me. It's a show that these people don't ever, they've never met each other. They have blindfolds up and the, they walk the person up to the altar and they take the blindfolds off and they said, will you, Lisa, marry Jim Bob? That is the first time that they see each other. That's scary. That is scary. And then they go through a, a, a period of time where they get to know one another. They, they are, they're hoping that their love for one another becomes captivating, that they stay together. And an unseen person. But we love an unseen Savior. But not only that, is that captivating love is undescribable. I can't describe it. I wish I could. I wish I could sit down with an unsaved person and describe the full extent of God's love and why I love you the same, but I can't. I can try my best, and I do try my best. But, but, but it's understanding that Jesus loved the very least, and he loved to the very end. That's, that's, that's tough right there. He loved the very least of them to the very end. Ephesians 3, 18 and 19 says, many you, and may you have the power to understand. It says that we don't understand it, but he says praying that may you have the power to understand as all God's people should, how wide and how long and how high and how deep his love really is. May you experience the love of Christ 
so it is so great, you will never fully understand it. Then you will be filled with the fullness of life and power that comes from God. We'll never understand it. God's just saying, you just, he, 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 uses, he uses the Nike slogan. He tells you, just do it. You're not going to understand it. Just do it. Love your neighbor. Just do it. Love the foreigner. Just do it. Make sure that you fight for peace. Just do it. Just do it. You don't have to understand it. He's telling you to just do it. It's a captivating love that builds our hope for eternity, that helps our enduring faith, that gives us living hope. Because there's going to be a day, and we're going to end on this. It's scary. But every believer, I mean, it's not scary because the words sound scary. But every believer is going to have to stand in front of the Bema seat of Christ. And that's, that, that's the judgment seat of Christ. And when we hear judgment, we start biting our nails. Oh, my goodness. You mean Jesus knows about those tapes that I keep up in my closet behind my sheets? One day we all are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. But it's not judgment that we think of it. We're not condemned. It says in, in Romans 9.1, it says that, that we, we're not condemned. Once we, once we are given to Jesus Christ, once we give our lives to Jesus Christ, we're not condemned. The judgment seat is us receiving the rewards. The rewards for what's done on this short little part of our lives. It, 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 it's the beam of seat. It, it, it's us standing before God and him putting the tape in and them getting the popcorn out and saying, come on, son, come on, daughter, let's check it out. Oh, look at that. Look at that. You, you, you pulled over that time. And this is, this is my conviction. God's saying, you pulled over. You were, you were running late to work, but you saw that person pulled off on the side of the highway, didn't know, and they were crying, and you pulled over to help them. Oh, look at this, this chance. You were in a restaurant, and you didn't have to, but you gave this person a track to tell them about me. Oh, goodness, I love this. This is good. Oh, look at this. Look at this. You, 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 you were in the midst of trials, and you didn't deny me, and these are the things that you're going to go through, and God is going to reward us. So like I said, it's important on this side. What we do for Christ will last because of the idea that there is an eternity waiting for us. There's an eternity right in front of us. So it, it, it's, it's our desire to please our parents. It's our desire to please our Father that should be the driving force behind what we do as believers. It's just the idea, there's a song that says, living my best life. That's the fact that we live our best lives here, but really we don't. Our best lives are waiting for the then. Our best lives are in front of us. But I want you to understand the fact that no matter what you're going through, that there's better yet to come. That, 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 that at the end of the road, there is better. I was just talking to my mother-in-law just yesterday, and we are talking about, and a lot of people don't want to talk about this, but we were talking about death. And I was sharing with her that, that many of us, we get upset when, when that time comes close. But I can almost guarantee if there was anyone that has been in the presence of Jesus, that have, if you, I, mean, I mean, and I don't want to get that because I get emotional, that if you are in the presence of our Savior Jesus Christ, I don't believe anyone would want to come back to this. When you really understand how much he loves you and cares for you, there's a future ahead, but we are so connected and built on the now that we forget about the then, the hope for eternity. This idea that we are here to please God and that it's something laid up in the future because of that. Because, guys, everything that comes to us, we're going to lay right back at his feet anyway. Every crown that we receive, we're going to lay it back at his feet. But I can tell you this. When I get to heaven, I don't want to just make it through and have one of those little spinny hats with the, you know, I want a crown. Not for me, but so that I can lay it back at his feet. What is your hope connected with? Where are you looking for when it comes to to hope, is it the fact that this is just the opening act? That this right here, the moment you say, boom, your life really begins. Because you were dead before that. You guys know that, right? That before you received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you were dead. You really didn't have any life. And the, and the word says that, that even before that, when you did not know him, that you did not have hope. It's impossible to be without Jesus and have hope, true hope. So the moment you received him, boom, that's when life began. And you begin to serve him. 
and you begin to be faithful and you begin to listen to him and saying, God, not my will, but yours be done. What is your purpose, God? I want to know your purpose and I want to fulfill it in my life. And then bam, at that last breath, bam, it says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And we don't like to think about it because we don't want to think about losing a loss, a loved one. But from that ending point, eternity with God, hanging out with them. Y'all, and I pray that you guys are not behind me in line because I'm going to hug Jesus for at least, at least for two, e- uh, two eons. At very least, I'm going to hug Jesus for that. Now. So y'all going to be in line looking at your watches like, Pastor Larry did teach about eternity, but we didn't think that we would have to stand in line for eternity. That's when it all begins. This eternity goes on and on and on. I want us to look towards the future, have hope that's eternal, built on the eternity that's ahead. It's amazing. It's amazing that we love and serve a God that loves us so much that he's prepared a place not made with human hands and that we all we all have a mansion there. Oh my goodness. We all have a mansion prepared just for you. I love my wife but I'm going to have my own mansion. I love my kids, but they're going to have their own mansion when they, when they declare Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. You have your own mansion. I feel, like, I feel like Oprah at this time. You get a mansion, and you get a mansion, and you get a mansion, and you get a mansion. But that's the truth. What's your hope built on? Psalm says, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for this eternal hope that's that's laid before us, God. We thank you for the idea and the fact that this hope is something that we can actually rest assured in. But God, I pray at this moment, God, that our eyes would shift from the now to the then. That we would seek to please you in everything we do, say, and think. So that at the end of the day, that you would look down at us and say to us, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things, but I'm going to make you ruler over many. Lord God, I pray that today, hopefully our eyes were open, that we would look at things a little differently, God, and that this idea of an eternal hope would be something that would motivate us, God. That, 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 that the fact that when we give our lives to you, it would not just be about a change in our destination, but it would be our very motivation for doing everything to glorify your name. So God, have your way. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus Christ's name, we do pray. And the people of God said amen Amen. and amen and amen. With all heads, continue to be bowed and and praying. If you are a believer, I want you to be praying now because there's people online, there's people that are listening, there's people that will listen. If you've never given your life to Christ, the, the idea of this eternal hope is only connected to the fact that you've given your life to Christ. I'm sorry to say, I wish I could give to everybody. It's offered to everyone. And at this moment, we're going to do that. If you've never said, Jesus, come into my heart, save me, this is the time to do it. This is the time to say, Jesus, come into my life. I I know that I'm a sinner. I can't get it right by myself. But I believe in the blood-stained cross of Jesus Christ. I believe that you came, lived a sinless life, that you died a death that you did not deserve. But on the third day, that God raised you from the dead. And now you sit with all power in your hand. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, if you know, don't have that eternal hope, I pray that right now that you would receive him. If you're online, if you want to do it, I pray that you would do it and you'll put it in the, the comment section. It's easy. All you have to say is, Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. But I also know that you sent your son to save me from my sins. God, I pray that you would come into my life, that you would be my Lord and my Savior. And I would declare this in every day, that I will seek to please you. If you said that, then you are in the kingdom. I want to applaud you. And if you did it, just put it in the comment section. And if you prayed that prayer, let us know. We want to celebrate with you. Now, when Jesus was here, he did a lot of things with all heads up. The one thing that he did tell us to do was this thing called communion. Um, at this time, 
The communion plates are in the front. I ask that you, those who want to partake in our communion today, that you would come up at this time and that you would take the elements. It's a double peel. You peel the top off and then you have the bread. And then you peel the bottom off for the juice. Are we going to hand them out or... No, you come up free. You know, it's just, I'm sorry. Yes. This is the time which actually they were celebrating the, the, the uh, this, we call it the Last Supper, but they actually were celebrating the Passover. The time when, 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 when they were in Egypt, the Israelites were in Egypt, and God had called them, Jesus, had, God had called them out of Egypt and told them, just, just hurry up and get out. And so they had to pack their things up really fast, and they had to now shift and move and, and get out of Egypt, and they did not even have time for their bread to rise. And so they had to take the unleavened bread, but that's the, that's the whole heart behind this Passover, the, the, this time where, where Jesus came and, and, and me, God told them to go, and, that, and this Passover was, was him passing over the homes that did not have the blood of the lamb over the doorposts. And God said, if I see the blood over the doorposts, then I will pass over that house. And every year they would celebrate this Passover. But Jesus took this Passover meal and he, he, he took it to a whole another level. The saying that you don't have to do this every year. You don't have to put the blood of a lamb over your dope horse every year because once you receive me, that's enough. I'm the sacrificial lamb. I'm enough for you all. By my blood comes a remission of sin. So on the night, do we have everyone here? In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, as Jesus is with his disciples in the upper room, he's teaching them, he's about to, he's about to leave. But he says to them this, he says, to, he takes the bread and he breaks it. And he says, this is my body. Now, if you, if you read that, it, it says, which is broken, but it's really not broken. It's what is actually given to you because the, the Bible says that no bone shall be broken. So he said, this is my body, which is given to you. Take and eat. After they had ate, he took the cup. He said, this cup is my blood. It's for the remission of all sins. My blood is enough to cover you all. He said to them, take and drink. Jesus, we thank you for your body. We thank you for the blood that you shed for us, God. We pray that our lives will be living examples of you. As we eat this bread and take and drink this blood, we're reminded of the sacrifice that you made for us. Allow us not to take this lightly. Use us, God. Shape us, mold us into exactly what you've created us to be. And we'll give your name all glory, all honor, and all praise. And the people of God said, amen. Let's give the Lord one happy time of praise. And that's how we can tithe. I hope you realize that this was our last message in the series of hope. And when I sat down to think about the messages that we've heard over the past few weeks, 
it became clear to me that there really is a, a lot of different kinds of hope. We have hope in some things here on earth. Some people do at least. We have some people in here that probably hope the Phillies will win the World Series again or they hope the Eagles will win the Super Bowl again. Well, that's hopeless hope. We have eternal hope. No matter what happens to us, no matter what happens around us, we know that we have hope in the future because God's told us that we have hope in the future. He's told us a number of different times. There's so many places where hope is mentioned in the Bible, but in Titus 1, verse 2, it says, in hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. He promised us eternal life before the world even began, and eternal hope. And it says again in Titus 3, 7, that being justified, which means cleared of all guilt, by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So we have hope in eternal life. And it also says in Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end, to give you hope, to give you hope in the future. So God gives us hope in so many different ways, and we've heard that over the past now four weeks. And as I was sitting thinking about um, this offering message a couple of times, one of the songs that we sometimes sing here in church came to my mind, and that is, uh, it goes something like this. My hope is in you, Lord, all the day long. I won't be shaken by drought or storms. A peace that passes understanding is my song, and I sing, my hope is in you, Lord. Not in anything of this earth, but in God. And he gives us living hope, which we've heard. He gives us eternal hope, and he gives us eternal life. He doesn't ask much of us in return. He just asks us to give something back to him. He doesn't ask us to give 50%. He just asks us to give in proportion to which he's blessed each of us. And that's the least we can do for the gifts that he's given to us so that he can, his, his work can be done here in this local community. So let us pray for the offering today. We thank you today, Lord, for the gift of eternal hope and eternal life. We also know that you've given us living hope so that each and every day, the storms that come around us, we know that they will end and there's going to be a better future. We thank you and praise you for giving us that hope and giving us the knowledge that there is a better place, that this is not our home. This is just where we are for the now. And we will eventually be with you in heaven eternally. Lord, we bless the people, these people here today. We ask that you take these gifts that are given and multiply them and use them for your purposes here in this local assembly. And we ask this in your name. Amen. again so much um i'm excited I, i'm i'm a little nervous guys i don't know if you guys could tell i mean i had some friends friend from um, from willowdale come up and pop up this morning that's where that's where god stole me from oh goodness but i spent a lot of good years and they were really good friends that showed up i don't want to say your names i want pastor greg to wonder who actually showed up i don't want to give them any hints so when, when I, I have i have lunch with them this week me and greg so i'm, I'm pretty sure he'll ask but we have it's my second set of visitors from Willowdale. It just, it just, it, bring, it brings joy to my heart um, for the reason that I believe that when God uses you, it doesn't matter where he uses you at as long as you're following his purpose and that there's no animosity, that there's still, I'm going to sneak back there when I get a chance, but it's a love and connection that will never be broken. So I want to say thank you guys for coming, for sneaking up on me. Um, 
it, it, mean, it really means the world to me. All right, so a few quick announcements. If you guys know uh, Michelle and Dusan, uh, Dusan, excuse me, they've had their first child. His name is David. Let's 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 just give them a little hand. David, they named them. I've spoken to him. I've spoken with him, and they're just excited. But uh, we just want to bless them and keep them and celebrate them. Keep them in your prayers um, as they just begin their lives as new uh, uh, mother and father. Um, and that we just want to always be supportive of our LCC family. This coming Wednesday, I mean, excuse me, this coming Thursday um, is our National Day of Prayer, May 6th. And we will be doing that here um, from 9 to 12, which we have general prayer in the sanctuary. We'll have certain places um, allotted for people that they want to have just actual special specific prayers. We have people here to kind of help and pray and lock arms with you. So from 9 to 12, and then at 12, we'll be having a the small devotional by Pastor Ron. He'll be doing a devotional uh, with us. So if, if you can, come on out. We're going to try to Zoom it. So we're going to try to get that together so that if you can't make it, that you'll also be able to participate via Zoom, which has become a norm, it seemed like. Um, quick reminder, every Saturday from 12 to about 1.30, uh, we've began our teen life group where we're getting together and we're going through uh, uh, this right now media content called Different. We're encouraging our teens to be different. It says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And we want to encourage them to do that, to be different, to be a different difference maker, to, to do something that's not in the norm and to do it for Christ. That's every Saturday. And just want to be encouraged. Hopefully everyone here has gotten the email from us in regards to the Right Now Media. It's a great platform um, for, ind for individuals, for children, for young adults, for men's groups. Um, gives you good t content in regards to Bible studies, uh, different the content in regards to women's studies, men's studies, uh, and, and on our page we've, we've allotted certain sections. We have a parenting section, we have a mental health section, we have a section just for men, just for women, young adults, teens, children. So go on the website if you haven't already signed up. It's free. We've paid for it, so now it's a gift to you guys. But to sign up, it's a great thing. You're looking for something for your kids to watch that you know is going to be pr appropriate, they have it for you. Amen. And last but not least, I know you guys say, Pastor Larry, how do you keep such a girlish figure? Don't laugh. You should not be laughing that hard, Dr. Jimmy. <laughs> and I know online right now, I know uh, that, uh, that Terry Williams is laughing also. But you guys should not laugh that way. In our Life Cafe every week, applaud the women when you go out there. Every week they make sure that we have something so that we could fellowship together around food and today we have spaghetti garlic bread and fresh fruit and we have a salad s-a-l-d a salad i'm assuming that's salad um and as you can see that i'm not a salad advocate pastor Davson, but i will eat it when i have to but you guys please if you have the time or if you can even if you're not getting anything just applaud the women because they're faithful servants and they do this. It's not just they pop up on Sunday and just throw something together. They're doing the week, getting things ready and getting things prepared. So please let them know that we appreciate them. And continue to be in prayer. Yes.